So the Q&A thing is kind of an easy way to tackle some of these questions. So people ask, what is the process for felonies? Well, I mean, I can kind of go through the basics of it. So when someone is accused of committing a, a crime that is a felony, felonies are anything that are over one year maximum imprisonment. So we're talking anything from low level felonies all the way up to murder type of things. So if you, someone is accused of doing that, the police file a police report and it's, it comes in as a warrant request. And the warrant request generally says what the prosecutor uh, is being asked to consider for charges from the police, but that doesn't always mean that that's what the charges are that are going to be filed. The prosecutor has the discretion to look at the facts of the case that are presented and decide from those facts what uh, charges we want to charge, what do we think that we can not only just pro prove a probable cause, which is like a tiny amount, but actually prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's the highest standard of the law. So if you're thinking like, probable cause is a tiny amount, preponderance of evidence is like more likely than not, uh, there's clear and convincing evidence, which is more like a 75%, and then beyond a reasonable doubt is the highest standard. So we don't take that lightly. You have to be very careful in deciding what charges to put on a complaint. Some people will see that at the preliminary exam, at times, charges are added. Well, people are human and uh, p police officers do the best they can to investigate something and get the statements from the witnesses and from the victims. But it, there are times where more information comes out that wasn't necessarily available to the officer at the time that they gave us the initial report. We're also very careful about trying to make sure we have dash cam and audio, video, body cams, pictures, all of that stuff to review before we charge. Um, there are occasionally times where the person is in custody. We have to make a decision within like 24 to 48 hours of what we're going to charge. So there are exceptions to every rule, of course. But a preliminary exam is then set uh, after the arraignment. So I guess going back, if somebody is arrested and they are in custody uh, in our jail facility, they are given uh, an arraignment either by a magistrate or by the judge, depending on the, the case and time of day. And there's a bond that is set. And there's a, I could do like a whole here thing on bond probably too. But bond is basically an amount that is set that if the person pays it or if it's a personal recognizance bond and they sign it saying that they promise to pay something if they don't show up, it is a promise that they're going to show up for all their court hearings. And with any bond in Michigan, they're not allowed to commit any other crimes while on bond and generally not to leave the state of Michigan, which is kind of confusing for people. We are a border county, so we are right on the edge of Indiana. A lot of people here live in Michigan, work in Indiana or vice versa, or they go down and do shopping in Indiana, whatever the case might be, but you're not permitted to leave the state of Michigan when you're on bond. So a bond is set, maybe the person bonds out, maybe they can't, uh, depending on how high the bond is. And the next step is then um, to go in front of the judge, they get arraigned in front of the judge, here's what your charges are, how do you plead? Uh, generally, everybody that gets charged with a felony pleads not guilty. And that's, people get weirded out by that. Like, well, if they're guilty, they're guilty. Well, yeah, but um, sometimes, you know, we can do a plea bargain or if you have uh, prior felonies, you are supplemented as a habitual offender. So there's a habitual offender um, second, a habitual offender third, and a habitual offender fourth. And depending on uh, how many prior felonies that you've been convicted of, that's how that habitual is added. And it adds either one and a half times or two times or uh, up to life uh, imprisonment for the maximum on your penalties. So it is pretty significant that if you have a prior felony, that uh, that habitual offender can be a huge, huge increase in what your penalty would be for what you're charged with if you get convicted. So after uh, you, get, you, you get arraigned and maybe you're in, maybe you're out, you'll see a lot of people are still in custody when they come in for their P, PCCs, a probable cause conference. And then the probable cause conference for our county, they're on Tuesday mornings, and those are in front of the district court judges. 
The probable cause conference is a time for the attorney for the defendant and the prosecutor to discuss whether or not there is a plea agreement, whether there's going to be a waiver of the pre-exam conference, or whether they are going to demand their pre-exam conference. The pre-exam conference, again, maybe you watch the other video, it's a basically a mini trial to determine whether or not there's probable cause, that much evidence, to charge a person with the crime. And in order to have, show that probable cause, you have to hit each of the elements of the crime. So Michigan has um, like the criminal jury instructions, which are an easy way for people if you're, if you're interested. Uh, go look at uh, what the elements are of particular crimes. I mean, again, anything from like fleeing and eluding third degree, fleeing and eluding fourth degree, you can look at what the differences in those are. So each of the elements, um, for example, fleeing and eluding, it's an easy one. If the officer is in uniform and there's lights and sirens and there, if it happens in an area where the speed limit is 35 miles per hour or under, it makes it a more serious fleeing and eluding of fleeing and eluding third instead of fleeing and eluding fourth. So sometimes that, that's the one thing that we have to make sure that we put uh, in the testimony is, well, what was the speed limit where this was occurring? So if we have the preliminary exam, it is the Tuesday after the PECC and it's in the afternoon on that Tuesday. So if we're having that, we have to get subpoenas out. We have to get the witnesses talked to and uh, make sure that we have everybody that we need to go forward with that hearing. Interesting though, the hearing just has to start within uh, 21 days from the date of the arraignment. So that's why they're set in that like one week apart fashion. But if we have a situation where we have a victim who is severely injured, not able to speak, or we have a police officer that's out of town, which happens, especially on the holidays, we then um, can deal with that by starting the preliminary examination and swearing in the first witness and maybe going through that entire first witness and then asking to adjourn at the end. We don't like to do that. It's certainly not ideal by any means. But if push comes to shove, uh, then we have to start and uh, send to it. Sorry, my low battery mode came on. Uh, once a preliminary exam occurs, if they have the preliminary exam and the court finds that there was, in fact, probable cause for each of the counts or charges, uh, sometimes they find it on some, sometimes they find it on all, sometimes they find it on none, sometimes we add them. So whatever the judge then decides, we file a felony information and then the case is transferred to circuit court. Uh, in circuit court, that's a whole other process, but basically uh, the case is then out of the district court judge's hands. So you'll sometimes hear the judge say, especially in the case of a waiver, if somebody's signing a paper waiver or doing a waiver on the record where they're saying, I'm not fighting being bound over into circuit court, I'm not demanding my pre my preliminary exam, it doesn't mean that they're admitting guilt. It doesn't mean that they're taking a plea. It just means that they're not demanding that hearing the following week to show that there's probable cause to charge them with a crime. There's lots of reasons uh, why somebody would or wouldn't want to have a preliminary exam. Can't give away all my secrets, right? Uh, but uh, certainly there are the defense side of it or the prosecution side of it, a lot of time and, and thought and strategy about whether you do those or not. And the prosecutor does have the right to demand the pre-exam uh, to happen, even if the defendant wants to waive it. And there have been a few times where defendants wanted to waive and for reasons that, that you know, were important, we, we went forward with that preliminary exam. So, uh, and again, you'll hear the judge say he can't adjust the bond for a person after that waiver is filed. So. A lot of times in district court, if somebody wants to have their bond addressed, they will ask for the bond motion to be heard before they sign that waiver to make sure that they get the chance to have the judge take a look at it. Uh, it kind of gives them more than one bite at the apple, as the judges sometimes say, because if the, the district court judge denies that, then the attorney for the defendant can always bring it up in front of the circuit court judge when it gets bound over. So hopefully that helps explain the district court felony process a little bit better. If you have any questions, drop them below and we'll see if we can get them answered.